Without further delays, I'd like to introduce uh, to Professor John Joe McFadden from the Surrey University, in, uh, yeah, University of Surrey, and uh, he will provide the, the welcome remarks uh, for this beginning of the symposium. Thank you very much, Professor McFadden. Bon dia, and good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Excellent, good. So, um, my name is uh, uh, John John McFadden, and um, I've been working on quantum biology for a number of years. And um, Clarice asked me to give uh, a talk on uh, quantum biology, in which what I will do in the first part, which is a little bit different from your program, but uh, we'll just swap things around a little, is give you an introduction to quantum biology that will be very general, uh, in the sense that um, hopefully um, it will be comprehensible to both physicists and biologists. And the challenge here, I always think in quantum biology, is to get the biologists on board. And um, so this will include a kind of introduction to what quantum mechanics is all about from, um, from the perspective of a biologist who's really trying to get to grips with um, um, the peculiarities of uh, quantum biology and uh, quantum mechanics. So we'll have an introduction to what quantum mechanics is all about, to um, aimed, at aimed at biologists particularly, um, I'm sure the, the um, physicists in the audience won't need such an introduction. But uh, let me see if I can share my screen now. Okay, so this is the question that inspired me to think about quantum mechanics and whether it might have a role in biology. And it really comes down to the difference between the stuff over here, the living stuff and the rocks that lie beneath it, beneath the living stuff. And what's always been very strange and peculiar to me is the difference is so stark. And what really has interested me as a biologist is what is the source of that difference? Why is life so different from the dead stuff, the inanimate stuff? What makes life so special? <clears throat> Interesting. Um, my Moving forward hasn't worked. Let me take the mouse back to its normal mouse. And maybe that might help. No. Okay. Ah, there we go. So <clears throat> now, um, the classical world is the one which we biologists are familiar with. It's the biology of apples falling, falling on um, Isaac Newton's head from a tree. <clears throat> it's the biology, uh, it's the um, physics of, um, um, of uh, the solar system. And ultimately, as we all know, at the microscopic level, it's really mostly down to thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is what drives chemistry, and chemistry is what drives biology. So, for example, a steam train... <clears throat> can be pushed up a hillside, say, by the action of steam. And steam, of course, if you look at it at a microscopic level, is just molecules of water bumping into each other at different temperatures. And really that's what drives steam trains up hills. And if you read most biochemistry textbooks, they'll tell you that that's also what drives life, that it's all to do with thermodynamics, the second law, which says that in any system, entropy, chaos is essentially will always be increased <clears throat> in any reaction. And that's what drives life according to conventional biochemistry. But I was never really, um, never really convinced by that. Um, and I'll come to some 
points will be able to make better points with some illustrations later on. But basically, there is a big difference between living stuff and, say, the uh, molecules of, of uh, steam, of water, bumping around inside a box. And that is, with thermodynamics, the structures we see, the reactions that we see, like a steam train running up a hillside, the structure in them, the direction in them, is provided, it, it, the structure in them is visible at a macroscopic level, but at a microscopic level, it's all chaos. It's all entropy. Molecules are just bumping into each other randomly. Now that's different in life, and we'll see some illustrations of that in a moment. But I think one of the key features that's different between the living systems and the non-living systems is that in the living systems, so actually, no, let's start with the non-living systems. In the non-living systems, structure is visible at a macroscopic level. But if you dig deep down to the microscopic level of molecules, then there's no structure. There's no organization. Life is different. It has structure all the way down. So if it has structure all the way down, then it occurred to me many years ago that maybe that structure will dig down into the quantum level and into the quantum world. And this is the kind of things that are, are familiar to physicists, at least, that the structure of atoms is clearly quantum mechanical. An electron isn't like a planet, as in the early part of the 20th century we thought of electrons or people thought of electrons as kind of planets orbiting the nucleus like the sun but we now know that they're nothing like that an electron is smeared out is a smeared out cloud it's delocalized around the atom and that makes it very different than our classical perception of an electron or any particle of protons on say um so that delocalization that wave mechanical property of uh, quantum objects like electrons is also responsible for many features, famous, famous thought experiments, for example, that um, just as an electron can be in many places, different places on the surface of an atom, so a cat can be in two different states at once, according to quantum mechanics. It can be alive and dead at the same time. And this is what one of the founders of uh, quantum mechanics, Erwin Schrödinger, came up with the idea his uh, Schrodinger's cat, that if you um, link a cat up with a radioactive atom that has a 50% chance of being um, decaying or not within a time span, then in quantum mechanics, you have to deal with that atom as being 50% decayed, 50% not decayed. But if the decay of the atom leads to the death of the cat, then you will get the rather peculiar situation where the cat is both alive and dead at the same time. And that seems to be allowed in quantum mechanics, but not in, in, in big objects. So there's obviously a cutoff between the quantum and classical world. Another very key experiment that illustrates many of the features of quantum mechanics is uh, what's called the double slit experiment, experiment, which we'll be look at, looking at in a bit more detail in a moment. But um, so there seems to be a, a division between the classical world ruled by thermodynamics and Newton's laws, obviously gravitational law that makes an apple drop from a tree or an, the earth rotate around the sun, plus thermodynamics. And that describes pretty much all of the classical world. But then the rules change in the quantum level. And the question is, in living stuff, like this starfish, it's clearly a classical object. It can only be in one place at once. But the particles of living stuff are very organized right down to the molecular level, as we shall see. And it seems possible that they may borrow some properties from the quantum realm. And this is what we're going to look at. So first of all, this is really for any biologists or, or, or just non-physicists in the audience. Um, what is weird about quantum mechanics? And we're going to illustrate it with an, ex 
um, an experiment that we'll uh, imagine. And that is the double slit experiment, uh, which demonstrates interference. And it can be demonstrated with all the ordinary lights. You shine light. In fact, we've got a light bulb here, but it needs a laser light. It needs to be of a single frequency. Um, if you shine light through two narrow slits close together, then you get interference patterns. You get some areas of light and shade. And those are caused when the waves of light can either meet where they reinforce each other, and then you go right and band, or when they interfere with each other. One of them's waving up, the other one's waving down, and they cancel each other out. And you get a dark band. Now, that happens with wave mechanical objects, such as uh, light, but it doesn't happen with particles, such as sand. If you pass sand through a double slit experiment, instead of getting an interference pattern like this, you'll get two piles of sand. Okay? So single waves go through both slits at once. That's a property of waves to generate interference patterns between alternative paths. <clears throat> and it's rather like dropping two pebbles in a, in a pond, in a still pond. You can see interference patterns. You can see that the waves, wave, water as a conglomerate of, um, of uh, uh, molecules will behave, has wave-like properties. And you'll see interference patterns where two sets of waves interfere with each other. A particle go through one slit at a time, whereas waves can pass through two slits at once. Particles go through one slit at a time and don't generate interference patterns. OK, now we ask that for electrons. We fire electrons at a screen, the double slit experiment. And first, in the first instance, we'll have one of the slits taped up. So it's really only a single slit experiment at the moment. And we fire electrons from the electron beam. And now they've only got one place to go. They only go through the lower slit. And over here in the, um, in the screen, is some uh, surface which will be luminescent when an electron hits it. So you'll see these dots. And what you'll find is that it's a pile of sand. There's no interference pattern. Electrons behave like a pile of sand. So the electrons are fired from the gun. They go in all directions. And only those that pass through the lower slit can go through the gun. And many of them fire and hit the screen and form these um, dots on the screen. Pile of sand. So electrons are particles, OK? So they only go through a single slit. Um, but what happens when you have two paths available? That's when it gets weird, because now, with two slits available, you get an interference pattern. And that's what you would think is that if a single slit gives you a pile of sand parallel with the slit, then if you open the other slit, then it'll just give you another pile of sand, but it doesn't. It gives you an interference pattern. And remember, interference patterns are patterns of waves that are caused by the waves either constructively or destructively interfering to give you light and dark bands. So it's strange. The electron behaves like a particle when there's one slit open, and then as a wave, if it's got two options of where to go, it gets stranger. So let me see if I can move this uh, bar that's in my way at the moment. Um, OK. <clears throat> no, I can't like that one. OK, but maybe the wave pattern is generated by the collective behavior of electrons, just as the wave pattern in a, in a still pool we know that the molecules of water um, aren't behaving quantum mechanically to make those waves. It's just collections of them. So perhaps it's the collections of electrons. When you send a beam of electrons, it'll have trillions of electrons. And it's their collective behavior that is giving the wave mechanical um, uh, phenomenon, the wave mechanical interference, rather than um, 
And in quantum effects, it's a classical wave like water waves. To investigate that, okay, to investigate that, we're going to, instead of having um, uh, firing lots of electrons, we're going to fire the electrons one at a time. So we fire electron, bang, it goes through one of those slits and forms a dot on the screen. Now that seems sensible. It's the electron started off as a particle, went through the slits and ended up on the screen as a particle causing a discrete dot on the screen. But as you fire more and more of them, you get an interference pattern. So that seems very strange that the electron is leaving the gun as a particle. It's arriving at the screen as a particle, but in between, it generates an interference pattern suggesting that individual electrons are still managing to go through both slits at once and behave quantum mechanically. So here we have an electron which has particle behavior. You can fire them once at a time, and then they arrive at the screen one at a time, but still what it seems like is that they're behaving like waves when you are not actually firing them or detecting them. So you think that's very strange. A single electro electron can't be in two places at once. It can't go through two slits at once, so you would think. So let's, let's find out where it's gone. And you can do that by putting a detector on one of the slits. And then we change our setup a little. We put a detector on one of the slits and the detector will fire, um, fire up and tell us that the electron's gone through the top slit or the bottom slit. Actually, we only need one detector because if we fire the electron from the gun and we see it arrive at the screen, it's got to go through one or the other. So all we need is a detector on the top uh, slit. If it detects, the electron it will fire. If it doesn't, we might know it must have gone through the bottom slit. So now we repeat the experiment and we'll be able to find out whether it's gone through one or the other. And what we find is that in this condition, we get two piles of sand. The interference pattern has gone and now the electron is behaving like a particle, both at the gun, at the screen and at the detector we get two piles of sand. Seems to have a def definite position. But now something even stranger happens. If we now turn the detector off, we get the interference pattern again. So that seems very odd that the electron, when you look at it, it behaves like a particle at the screen. But when you're not looking at it, you're not measuring it at the screen, it behaves like a wave and goes through both slits at the same time. So it seems to be that the electron starts off as a particle, it's fired from the gun, but then it becomes a wave as it travels through space, going through both uh, slits at the same time. But then when it reaches the screen, it turns back into a, a particle and arrives at a single point on the screen. So particles, this is the this is the fundamental um, insight of quantum mechanics, that particles can behave as waves as well, and they can be delocalized and travel um, through two different paths through this double slit experiment. As you might will see, the particles may also be able to travel through two different paths in living systems. So this behavior could be interesting. Um, okay, but if you have the detector on, then you're looking at the electron when it arrives at the first screen, the split screen, and having the detector on forces it to become a particle at that point and then you get the pile of sand. And this brings us into one of the biggest mysteries in quantum mechanics, the measurement problem. So if you measure the electron, it's better to start off the other way around. If you don't measure the electron, then it behaves as a wave. But if you do measure the electron, it behaves as a particle. 
And then you come to the big question, what is a measurement? And people are still arguing about that, about this question um, a century after it was first posed. What is a measurement in quantum mechanics? And what is the difference? The difference between the classical world and the quantum world is then the quantum world, things aren't measured. As soon as you measure them, you find the position of a particle, then it becomes a classical particle, a classical object. The question is in biology, where 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 does biology sit in, in its fundamental level? Is it um, is it measured? Are particles inside living cells behaving like um, uh, waves or particles? That's a quantum measurement. So this is just um, what we've um, um, been looking at. The particles behave as waves when we're not watching them, but uh, uh, in which case they can be in two or more places at once. We call this quantum coherence, that a particle can be coherent at two different positions, or a quantum superposition, that it can essentially be in two places at once. Measurement forces the wave to choose, I know that choose isn't the right word, but it's the easiest word, one route and therefore become, thereby become a localized particle. So this is, an what is fundamentally different at the quantum level. Things are waves, they're not localized until we look at them. And this is true for electrons. As we know, electrons are moving around inside living cells. It's also true for protons. Protons have moved around inside living cells. They're part of the living process. So if they behave like this in the laboratory, can they behave like that in living cells? It's the question of quantum biology. Um, okay. So, so we've discussed then the uh, double slit experiment, and it really is the key to everything in quantum biology. It has all of the phenomena of quantum biology in that experiment. So it's, um, it shows that uh, particles like electrons can be delocalized as they are in atoms, in the orbits of atoms. In the uh, Electrons are uh, delocalized also in molecules such as benzene. The pi electrons in benzene are delocalized around the six carbon atoms. They don't have a single position. There's only three of them and they're everywhere. So, and that's responsible for the properties of the chemical properties of benzene. So those quantum mechanical properties can have macroscopic consequences. Um, the double, and uh, uh, showing this cat is, is essentially where um, a, um, a radioactive particle can be in two states at once, and it's linked to the cat, then according to the rules of quantum mechanics, it's in two states at once. Measurement is when we look at the cat and we make the cat become either dead or alive. But where does that ha measurement happen is a key kind of question. So these are the key features of quantum mechanics. Wave particle duality is the bottom of it all. And that leads to coherence. The uh, particle systems, if they're coherent, then they display, they display these properties, such as superposition, which is what um, I should have here as a, as a title as well, superposition, that they can be in many places at once. They can spin in two different directions at once. Quantum tunneling is when particles can pass through uh, barriers that they wouldn't pass through um, uh, classically. And then there's entanglement, weird action at a distance. I mean, we might mention that, but its role in biology is less clear. So why, why is all this interesting? Well, for example, it's interesting because you can do quantum computing with um, the weird properties of quantum mechanics. And uh, one of the weirdest is this entanglement that when particles are quantum mechanically connected, you can pull them far apart and they still correlate with each other. With each other. They still have links. That's illustrated here by the strings between these particles. And you can use those strings essentially in quantum computing to compute. And that kind of computing scales exponentially with the number of qubits. Qubits are the quantum mechanical, um, correspond to the quantum mechanical bits. And now you can be very powerful. This is why people are, uh, one of the reasons why people are very interested in, in quantum mechanics and uh, computing uh, and quantum computing because quantum computing scales exponentially with the number of bits. And this is nicely illustrated with the 
story, um, the uh, tale of the inventor of chess, who apparently came to the emperor of India and uh, um, this, uh, demonstrated the game. And the emperor was so pleased that he offered the inventor anything he wanted. Just choose whatever you like. And uh, what the inventor said was, well, what I'd like would be um, all of the rice grains that uh, we can fit on a, um, uh, that uh, uh, correspond to a chessboard in which the single grain on one and then two and then four and then eight and then 16 and uh, 32, etc. And you keep going on. But as you can see, these numbers get huge very quickly. So that to reach the end of the chessboard, we required 202 to the power of 63 grains of rice, roughly equivalent to the entire world's rice harvest throughout the history of mankind. So although the emperor agreed to um, have the inventor's um, a request, he was never able to deliver because that's what exponential delivers. So, um, so what that tells you is that the power of a quantum computer scales exponentially. So for example, a quantum computer with 300 qubits could outperform classical computers the size of the, of the entire universe. So that's why people are interested in quantum computing. That's why one of the first claims that came out of quantum biology was that quant uh, living cells may be able to quantum compute it was very interesting. But, the question is, why don't we see particles being in two places at once? At the, at the moment, football is, is going on in, in Qatar, and um, footballs don't, they go in, in, aren't in two places at once. They're always localized on the pitch. They only uh, are either in the goal or out of the goal, and uh, they never, no one ever scores a goal and doesn't score a goal at the same time. So what's the difference between the strange laws of quantum mechanics that operate at the um, at the molecular level, uh, atomic level, particle level, and the classical world. How I illustrated this in this uh, slide, showing that if you could do behave like electrons in the double slit experiment, and you wanted to drive to work, and you didn't know which way to go, in quantum mechanics, if you were quantum mechanical, you could go by both routes at the same time, and that would. You know, if there's a traffic jam on one of them and not on the other, that could be handy. But we can't. And that's because this feature, decoherence, decoherence is the breaking up of coherence. Actually, well, well, this is probably an easy way of explaining it. So decoherence is, coherence is the key property of systems that allows them to be quantum mechanical. And it's really just that the waviness of the system, if, if electrons have wave pro properties, then that wave has an amplitude and it has a phase. And if the amplitude and phase of two electrons are in step, then they can be coherent if they behave like this. But if the um, waves are out of step, then we get interference and we don't get quantum mechanical behavior. So decoherence is essentially when the wave mechanical properties become out of step in complex systems, and that kind of destroys the connections between them. Um, so the weird properties of, of matter, the quantum mechanical properties of matter, like coherence, superposition, quantum tunneling, entanglement, only apparent, um, if a system is coherent. Random molecular motion, as you can see here, destroys the coherent dependent quantum processes. And that's what we call decoherence. And that's why when physicists come to study properties, the quantum properties of matter, they normally have to do it in very rarefied environments, in a vacuum, in a system close to absolute zero, which slows down all the particles, and on an optical table, which um, shields the system from vibrations. And then it can detect quantum particles. But in the real world, it's very hard to detect quantum particles. It's as difficult as uh, balancing a pencil on your finger. Any disturbance will knock off, will, will disturb the quantum coherence and you'll get an entirely classical system. 
So this is one of the features why, in for example, when I did biochemistry many years ago, I did not learn about quantum mechanics because it was thought to be irrelevant to biological systems because quantum mechanics, the strange properties of quantum mechanics require coherence, and they're easily lost in complex, hot, no molecularly noisy environments. And um, we can see that if we compare that situation we had before dropping a pebble into a, into a still pond, you can see the wave mechanical effects, you can see the interference pattern. Try dropping a pond, uh, a pebble into a torrent of water, a waterfall, and you will not see waves, you will not see interference patterns. And really then the question is, what is biology most like, the still pond or the torrent? And for most biologists, the answer is, of course, the torrent. This is what this is a, a simulation of um, a cell membrane. And as you can see, it's everything's moving. Let's put it on again. Everything's moving. Everything's uh, moving against each other. And it's dominated really by random motion. So you would expect that the quantum mechanical aspects of living system wouldn't really survive for any length of time because the random motion inside li living cells is likely to break them up and it would become a decohered, incoherent system. But not everyone thought that. Uh, Erwin Schrodinger, um, uh, one of the pioneers of uh, quantum mechanics, the founders of quantum mechanics, did speculate that genes may be quantum mechanical. I mean, we won't go into the, into the reasons for it, but one of them was that it showed single units of inheritance. It, um, a, it showed um, number uh, uh, characters were inherited in um, in whole number ratios. So it would be one to three, for example. And P would be um, three times wrinkly and one times round in a generation. And he thought that can really be explained by classical systems. So he proposed that a gene, or perhaps the whole chromosome fiber, is, it, is an aperiodic crystal in which every atom and every group plays an individual role. So an aperiodic crystal. So it's it's like a crystal, but in which the crystal units are different. That's the aperiodic bit. It means that it's behaving like a crystal, but each unit of the crystal isn't identical. They're all a little bit different. And so they can play an individual role which has to be a masterpiece of highly differentiated order, safeguarded by the conjuring rod of quantum theory. So he was saying that heredity, at least in living cells, was a quantum mechanical phenomenon back in 1944. This was before the structure of DNA was known. It wasn't really clear what the inheritable material was in living cells. But when it was discovered, of course, a decade or so later by uh, Watson and Crick, they discovered that uh, genetic material, genetic, the genetic code is actually a quantum code. Um, this is a single genetic letter, if you like, a pairing of a purine and primitive base. And this pairing is what genetic information is written in, in the um, double base, in the um, uh, double helix, each genetic letter is a pairing of bases, um, a base on one on strand, a complementary base on the other strand. That's what makes the genetic code. That's what gives a genetic, a, a letter in, in the genetic alphabet. And that's what's determined the color of your eyes, some features of your, uh, of your health, et cetera, they're determined by information down at the level of a single molecule, a DNA that you inherited from your mother or your father. And if we look even closer at the uh, um, at the double uh, at the um, DNA, you'll see that actually what forms the genetic information is the position of hydrogen atoms here, which form hydrogen bonds between the purine and the pyrimidine. And a hydrogen bond is, of course, fundamentally quantum mechanical. It's a delocalized proton. It's a proton that's delocalized across the chemical bond. So these hydrogen 
the nuclei of a hydrogen atom release a hydrogen bond, a hydrogen bond um, is, essentially, is essentially a quantum mechanical uh, feature. But does that make any difference to life? Um, and what I'm pointing out here is that this isn't only true for DNA, but it's also true for many other features of um, living systems. This, shows, uh, this is a simulation of an enzyme, dihydrofolic reductase. It takes in a molecule of uh, substrate, and then it twists and bends and turns it, and turns it into a molecule of the product. Now, it's molecular level engineering. It's pulling protons and electrons around in the substrate to make the product. And so it's not surprising, as you will find out, that enzymes have been shown to have some quantum mechanical features because they're, they're manipulating single particles, single molecules, single particles in single molecules. So they're bound to bump into the laws of quantum mechanics because if you, are, if you ask any physicist what's the laws you need to explain single molecules, let's say quantum mechanics. And even at the level of DNA replication, which is During this DNA movie, replication, oh, both strands of the double helix turn the sound off. But um, uh, in DNA replication, it's taking a single strand and replicating it. And again, the enzymes that are doing this action are working at the level of electrons and protons inside molecules. Enzyme complex. Um, Here, the okay, you want to just do that anymore? So life is quantum level molecular engineering. And really the, um, the original, or if you like, the fundamental idea of quantum biology is that life uniquely amplifies quantum level events to the macroscopic level. And this, we go back to the difference between the living and the dead stuff in my first slide. The dead stuff is all dominated by by thermodynamics and nothing from of the quantum level is visible at the level of a microscopic object but if you look at the color of your eyes say then you will find that that has been inherited by a single molecule in your the dna that you inherited from your mother or your father and that was a single molecule and that color was determined by the position of a proton and that has been amplified to the level of a macroscopic object you arrive. So this is the insight or at least the um, the um, the fundamental principle of quantum uh, quantum biology that quantum mechanical stuff gets amplified to make macroscopic consequences in living cells. But after Schrodinger made the um, uh, proposal, and even though it was shown that um, DNA code is, does have this quantum mechanical feature, people really ignored that and went on and um, found molecular biology and made huge advances without reference to quantum mechanics. Throughout the latter half of the 20th century, through most of my um, uh, career, no one really need, thought you needed quantum mechanics in biology and managed to make huge advances in molecular biology and its application into, for example, medicine. But towards the end of the 20th century, some um, quantum mechanical systems were, or some systems were identified that might have quantum mechanical properties. And these were, uh, these were the proposals that uh, um, uh, have been uh, for systems that may behave quantum mechanically. Uh, photosynthesis, enzymes, magnetoreception, smell, DNA mutations, origin of life, and consciousness. So I'll go through some of these, and I know you'll be having some talks later, which will be looking at these in a lot more detail, but I thought it would be useful to have this kind of overview. So photosynthesis, it's um, it's extraordinarily important reaction, of course, it makes pretty much all the biomass on the planet. Um, it's either made by plants or microbes that are photosynthetic, or it's made by, um, uh, or, or it, uh, plants make, uh, use photosynthesis to make biomass, and then we animals eat their biomass. So all of the all of the biomass pretty much has been made by this kind of reaction in which light is captured 
and turns water, air, and a few minerals into biomass. And that's the most remarkable reaction in the entire universe, that we're in the known universe, that you take light, air, and water, and you turn it into a plant. And that is the most remarkable thing, and does it involve quantum mechanics? It was thought not, but then experiments in, in Greg Engel's lab and, um, and other labs in um, the early part of this uh, millennium um, demonstrated that there were some potential features of quantum mechanics going on. So we'll have a look at uh, what a, a photosystem is, which do, does quantum, which does the um, photosynthesis um, inside plants and inside microbes. It consists of chlorophyll molecules, which are a pigment that capture light, in this very organized system called a photosystem of pigment molecules. And what happens in photosynthesis is a photon of light is captured by a magnesium atom. It excites, say, um, the energy of, of the light excites, say, um, electron to cause it to vibrate, to become an exciton. And that energy is then transferred to the reaction center where it's captured into a chemical called ATP. What is known about this transport reaction, which a photon, the energy of a photon of light is captured and then transferred to the reaction center, is that under optimal conditions, it's pretty close to 100% efficient. All of the photons get captured in optimal conditions. And that's a higher energy transport efficiency than any technological um, energy transport. Basically, we can get around about 70% under ideal conditions. So it's an incredibly efficient system. And why, how it manages this is a problem because it should suffer from the traveling salesman problem in that a photon of light may be captured at one point in the photosystem. It's got to get to another point, a reaction center, but it doesn't know where to go. So it could wander anywhere in the reaction center, but the exciton only has a limited lifetime and then it will lose its energy to fluorescence. So it's got to get there quick to capture the energy, and it does under optimal conditions. How does it do it? How does it manage to find the reaction center so quickly? Uh, so um, working Greg Younger's lab and Greg Skoll's lab showed um, that um, if they shone a laser light at the system, they detected what they call quantum beats, which indicated that the electron was actually traveling through the system as a quantum coherent system, as a quantum coherent entity rather than a classical particle. And this just illustrates actually that the traveling salesman problem is a big problem. This is what a photosystem really looks like. It's really packed full of these chlorophyll molecules and the photon can be captured anywhere and it's got to be delivered somewhere. So mostly it should get lost and it doesn't. So these are the quantum beats that um, um, Greg, uh, the two Gregs discovered in um, in uh, in photosystems. Essentially, it showed that the the system behaved like a wave. So instead of the particle, the electron traveling from one place to another um, by uh, as a particle, it travels through all of the possible paths as a wave. So if we go back to the two slit experiment, it's it's going through all possible paths or through all of the all possible slits at once, if you like. And that traveling through all possible paths gives these quantum beats in the experiment where they use, um, um, they excite the system with one um, beam and then detect it with another. So they're looking at how this, energy is transported through the system and it seems to be transported in waves, these quantum beats. Okay, so that indicated the quant that quantum mechanics uh, may be involved in photosynthesis. I ought to point out that this is still controversial. 20 years later or, or thereabouts, uh, there's still a lot of argument about whether this really is quantum mechanical. There's less argument about the other system, which is enzymes. So I said that all biomass is made by photosynthesis, pretty much. All biomass is actually made by enzymes. Enzymes are what transform one biochemical into another. So every biochemical in your body has been made by a, an enzyme. Every biomolecule in your body has been made by an enzyme. And as I pointed out already, 
they manipulate individual molecules. So they're bumping into, um, into quantum mechanics. They're extreme. What are they? They're, um, they're catalysts. So they catalyze chemical reactions, but by extraordinarily high factors, as high as 10 to the 20. And to give that some perspective of what uh, an acceleration of 10 to the 20 means, if you could accelerate your walking speed by a factor of 10 to the 20, you could walk across the entire galaxy in an hour. So that's the kind of acceleration that is delivered by enzymes. And it's very hard to account for that kind of acceleration by classical mechanisms of accelerating chemical reactions. So there's a, there's a, a gap there. How do we account for this? And um, it seems to be that quantum mechanics is involved. And it's quantum tunneling. In this case, um, what is happening is quantum tunneling allows a particle to go through an in, a classically impenetrable barrier. It allows particles to, if you like, walk through walls. They can go, they can go through walls. And you can see this in the, in the uh, video here where some of the particle has been simulated a particle in a box, and then some of it can pass through the wall of the box into the other side of the box. And um, that's being demonstrated first for electrons in enzyme reactions that they they um, uh, move by quantum tunneling in some instances, and also more recently, protons are also have also been shown to um, tunnel in, be involved in in uh, tunneling reactions inside enzymes. So this is another way of looking at it, that a particle has a wave mechanical feature and some of the wave penetrates through the barrier and that's how you get quantum tunneling. So that's been demonstrated with um, experiments in which, um, a, uh, for example, a hydride ion can be um, moved from one place to another on a molecule by an enzyme and experiments in to the Clemens lab in California, Nigel Scruton's lab in Manchester showed that if you replace the hydrogen in the hydride with deuterium, then that depresses the rate of reaction more than you would expect from classical mechanisms. So these are the uh, kind of experiments they do. They, um, they measure the rate of reaction both with hydrogen and with heavier isotopes like deuterium and tritium. And um, the quantum tunneling can be envisaged as, as um, a, a double well potential. So a particle, uh, in this case a proton, can be in one well, and in order for the enzyme, act, enzyme action to proceed, it has to move over to the other well. They can do so classically if it has enough energy by going over the top of the well, over the barrier. And that's a classical mechanism or it can do it by tunneling, which can tunnel through the barrier, going through the, the wall, if you like, or it can do it by a combination of both uh, classical raising its energy and tunneling. The rate at which these happen for different um, isotopes of hydrogen will be different because mass is, um, influ is very influential on the rate of tunneling the mass comes into the exponential of the equation for tunneling. So if um, mass is increased from one, uh, from, um, uh, one for hydrogen to two for deuterium, then that will depress the rate of tunneling. And that should change the rate of activity of the enzyme. You get what's called a kinetic isotope effect. And what uh, uh, Klinman and uh, Scruton showed is that many enzymes have kinetic isotope effects that can't be accounted for by classical mechanisms and indicate that in these enzymes, how they're managing to, um, to proceed through the, to make the reaction go so fast relative to the uncatalyzed reaction is they bring the substrate so close that they allow tunneling of electrons and protons between the different parts of the reaction. And that tunneling wouldn't happen without quantum mechanics. And it's delivered by um, the quantum mechanical features of the active site of the enzyme. And this is what's shown here, the active site of the enzyme, which... Um, so that's another area of, of, of quantum mechanics. Another um, feature where, another 
phenomenon in biology that is proposed to be quantum mechanical is smell. And um, smell has gained, again, what we tend to look at in quantum biology is those phenomena which can't easily be accounted for by other classical mechanisms. And smell is, is one of them. It's highly specific. You can smell, we can smell thousands of different um, uh, um, um, molecules. Um, and um, it's highly sensitive. Uh, we can smell a single molecule. Um, and um, uh, and so it's very hard to account for that by solely classical mechanisms. Now, the standard explanation for how odor odor molecules, such as limonene, which is the uh, molecule that gives lemons their lemony smell, limonene, it's an aromatic molecule, how it's detected is thought to be through a lock and key mechanism. And that's um, the standard model for how um, um, odor receptors work, or factory receptors, as they're properly called, that you have an odor molecule, and then you have a complementary structure on the receptor, and the odor molecule binds the receptor, it's the, it's the key that turns the lock, and then the lock sends a signal to um, uh, the brain saying, okay, there's a lemon there. Um, so it depends on this fitting, it's a shape, um, fitting that uh, provides the key to the specificity. The different odor molecules have different shapes. They have to be recognized by different receptors. And that's why we have thousands of different receptors, odor receptors in our, in our laser, in our nose. Um, but there are some issues with that explanation. And that is certain molecules such as these, this, these two molecules, they both have pretty much the same smell, but they look very different. They don't look like they have the same shape at all, but yet they have the same smell. So how can they have the same smell? Here's two molecules that have the same smell, musky smell, both of these are musk smells, and um, yet their shapes are very different, but they have the same smell. Here's two molecules in which the shapes are very similar, but one is odorless, the other one smells of urine. And yeah, they look very, very similar. It's just this single group here. So there's some peculiarities that don't seem to fit the lock and key, the shape theory of, uh, of how molecules are smelled. But Luca Turin, um, uh, he, he um, more or less single-handedly came up with this idea that... Um, um, that smell may be a quantum mechanical sense. And it depends on the odor molecule uh, being recognized by the olfactory receptor, maybe by some shape recognition, but it also induces a quantum tunneling event of an electron once it's inside the, um, the receptor. And that is induced by a particular molecule, a particular structure within the molecule. For example, here, these two musky molecules, musky smelling molecules, they have this group in common. And what he proposes, what Luca Turin proposes, is that the quantum tunneling event is recognizing the vibration of this group. And it's a vibration sensor. It's more like a spectroscopy system than a lock and key mechanism. So, and it depends on the quantum tunneling that the odorant comes in and promotes a tunnel, quantum tunneling event across the receptor. So that's the theory. Was there any evidence of it? Or again, you can go to the heavy isotope experiments, look for a kinetic isotope effect in, 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 um, in the system. And here, what uh, Luca Turin did with uh, colleagues in Italy was to um, make a um, molecule of acetophone, uh, phenone, um, which is an odorous molecule, in both hydrogen form, normal uh, hydrogen, and then in deuterium. Now, chemically, they should be the same. They should have exactly the same shape, and they should have exactly the same chemical properties. But what he discovered was that a drosophila was able to distinguish between these two molecules and could tell which one was hydrogen and which one was deuterium. And that's very hard to explain through a classical mechanism. Again, like most things in quantum biology, this remains controversial. 
Now, entanglement. Um, actually, because entanglement has not really been demonstrated in any biological system, we'll skip over entanglement. It was proposed to be involved in this, the magnetoreception of, uh, in birds, but you don't really need entanglement for it. So this is uh, the European robin, which migrates from Scandinavia down to the Mediterranean um, when it gets too cold in Scandinavia. Um, these are the woodchuckers, uh, a very charming uh, German couple who uh, demonstrated some strange features about the magnetic compass they use. So when they migrate south, they have a compass. They somehow can detect the geomagnetic field of the Earth. But there were some features that were a little bit strange. It required light. The compass was in their eye. And that's strange. It's not at all like a Boy Scout's compass. We would call it a magnetic compass that we all know. It was also an inclination compass. And that's a compass that doesn't point at, at uh, the North Pole, say. It just points at the nearest pole because it finds the angle between the Earth's magnetic field and uh, the surface of the Earth. And this is shown here. So this shows the Earth's magnetic field at different points on the globe. And you can see that it's um, um, vertical at the poles, horizontal at the equator, and in between it's pointing into the Earth at a particular angle. And if you look for that angle, it always points to the nearest pole. Now, an inclination compass always does that, it doesn't distinguish between poles, but points to the nearest pole. It just measures the angle between the Earth's magnetic field and the Earth and heads in the direction of the sharp angle, sharpest angle. And what the Walsh Ghost demonstrated is that robins have an inclination compass. So that's odd. So first of all, how do you make a compass out of flesh? That's a really tricky thing to think about anyway. And how do you make it as an inclination compass. Well, Klaus Schalten, the German chemist, demonstrated that certain reactions in chemistry are magnetically sensitive. And those reactions are what are called uh, radical pair reactions. They generate a radical pair. Radical pair is, of course, two chemical species which have single electrons. And electrons are magnetic. They, they have a charge and they spin, so they're magnetic. But two of them in a normal orbit, orbit, you normally have paired electrons. And because they spin in different directions, they don't have a magnetic, magnetic moment. So you don't get any magnetic field. But if you pull them apart and create a radical pair, then those unpaired electrons are magnetic. And in those situations, then the reaction which takes place after you made the radical pair is sensitive to magnetic fields. And this is what Klaus Schulten demonstrated in 1976. You can generate a pair, or a radical pair, and it can be a singlet or a triplet, depending on whether the, the pairs are um, spinning in the same direction or in different directions. And if you apply a magnetic field, then you can change the Proportions of the products, whether they're singlet products, triplet products, uh, will be changed by a magnetic field. He went on to propose that it might be involved in the in a in the magnetic reception in uh, magneto reception in animals, but didn't really have any idea what kind of molecule would be involved. Uh, Thurston Ritz uh, came up with the right kind of molecule, cryptochrome. It's a protein in the back of the retina that he proposed was the um, magnetoreception detector uh, through a radical pair mechanism. And here is uh, cryptochrome. And uh, one of the things, uh, he also did an experiment with the Wilschkos in which they demonstrated that um, um, the magnetic sense of the European robin was disrupted by high frequency radio waves. Now, quite how this what what is going on isn't entirely clear even today, but it certainly seems likely that it's more likely to be a quantum mechanical system rather than a Boy Scouts compass. Um, so they demonstrated this that uh, um, a resonance effect indicated they were thinking the thinking was that the uh, high frequency ra radio waves are resonating with this radical pair formed in the system and you form a radical pair and that's um, got some frequency or resonance 
that is picked up by the radio waves. So that uh, that is uh, that is probably one of the best established uh, feature, um, features of quantum biology or, or phenomena in quantum biology, and it's still actively being investigated by a number of groups around the world. Now uh, we come to less clear um, quantum biology. Um, the Nobel Prize winning mathematician, Oxford based mathematician Roger Penrose, and the American anesthetist uh, Stuart Hamhoff propose that consciousness is um, quantum mechanical, caused by collapse of the quantum wave function in these structures called microtubules in the brain. Now, microtubules form the cytoskeleton, the internal skeleton of cells. And there are thousands of them in every, every cell, including neurons. So the brain has trillions of these microtubules. Now, consciousness is, the puzzle of consciousness is how you manage to have so much information in a conscious mind at the same time. And it's all seems to be bound up together. So what is making this conscious mind? And what Penrose and Hammerhoff uh, proposed is that it's a quantum mechanical uh, feature. It's caused by quantum coherence in microtubules in different neurons. But um, they proposed that back in the 1990s. And to be honest, there's not really been any solid evidence at all for this, this model. And it's really kind of unlikely. All of the systems I've been looking at so far, the feature of them is that the bit that's quantum mechanical is small and singular. It's a single photosystem that will be quantum mechanical, a single enzyme molecule that will be quantum mechanical. This requires quantum coherence in trillions of microtubules right across the brain. So all of the microtubules across the brain that are encoding an image such as think of a tree and it's there in your mind, um, then they've all got to be quantum mechanical and not many people um, I know of no biologists and uh, very few physicists to give uh, the idea any credence today. And now, um, now I think uh, we've been, I've been going for an hour, so I think it's probably time for a break. And then we're going to talk after the break about um, Schrodinger's other proposal that uh, uh, mutations um, are um, involve quantum jumps. So shall I stop sharing at this point? and um, return to the chair. <clears throat> Welcome back everyone. And um, what I'm going to do now is fairly briefly talk about uh, some of um, our recent work on looking at one of the other areas for quantum biology. And that's whether um, Erwin Schrodinger's other proposal about, um, idea about uh, heredity was that mutations might be caused by quantum jumps. And um, so what are mutations? Mutations are really the um, um, the reason we're here. Um, evolution could not proceed uh, if it were not for mutations. They have um, uh, generated the variation that is selected on by natural selection. But they're only discovered in, um, all genes were only discovered in um, the 19th century by Mendel, who uh, showed that heredity came in whole number ratios, very odd, which uh, didn't seem to be similar to any other property in, in um, living systems, these whole number ratios, um, suggesting that uh, genes were a kind of digital uh, entity. Um, so mutations are errors in, in copying genes, and they're, of course, responsible for um, uh, for variation in uh, in living organisms that are acted on by uh, natural selection to generate the evolution. And this shows an evolutionary tree um, from a single organism 4 billion years ago to the tree of life of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, including animals in this tiny little branch that branched off about 500 million years ago. All of that was, all of the variation that was generated uh, in this entire tree of life was generated by mutations. So it's responsible for biodiversity, but it's also responsible for disease. Cancers are caused by mutations. Malignant growths are caused by somatic mutations, um, mutations that occur in uh, tissue, um, in flesh, um, whereas um, 
the variation in germline is, um, uh, sorry, the mutations in the germline are the um, are the material for evolution. Uh, and also mutations are responsible for genetic diseases, such as uh, uh, this disease here, keratolytic winter erythema. But all of the genetic diseases are essentially caused by mutations. So when Watson and Crick discovered um, DNA, um, they already proposed, they proposed in their early papers, a mechanism for mutations. And um, it looks at the mechanism involves the structure of the DNA molecule, um, which has the pair bases. This shows the adenine thymine base pair. And as I've already pointed out, the genetic code, the uh, specificity of that pairing is delivered by these protons, which uh, form hydrogen bonds between the bases. And um, so that uh, uh, really tells us that genetic information is written into proton positions. If you took away the DNA uh, double helix, you could still have the same information if you just have the protons there. So although it's often said that uh, quote, quantum coding, writing stuff in quantum entities, was um, um, first achieved by uh, IBM in uh, 1989, um, microorganisms invented this 4 billion years ago in, um, in encoding information at the level of position of protons, um, which uh, was the start of life. So causes of mutations. And the first thing you have to bear in mind is there are many causes of mutations, DNA breakage, uh, chemicals such as nitrogenous and nitrous acid will cause base damage, dimerization of primitive bases by UV light, um, and uh, many other causes. Uh, heat is a, is a, a mutation as well. Um, so there are many causes of mutations, but one of them is, is just incorrect base incorporation when DNA is replicated. So DNA, when DNA is replicated, the double strands peel apart and a new strand is made on the template of an old strand. And that new strand DNA, uh, is made by the enzyme DNA polymerase, and it's meant to put in the correct base um, in the new strand that is complementary to the, uh, the base in the in the uh, template. So if uh, the template is a T, it should put in an A. If a template has a G, it should put in a C, etc. Mutations occur, also occur when the DNA replication machinery makes a mistake and puts the wrong base in to make a mutant. And it's also random, like the um, uh, radiation and chemicals this um, mutational mechanism is random. It doesn't make any choices about what kind of DNA it's going to mutate. Um, but uh, Watson and Crick proposed back in um, one of their early papers that mutations could occur because of a base occurring very occasionally in one of its less likely tautomeric forms at the moment when the complementary chain is being formed. So these are... Um, uh, <clears throat> this is a normal Watson and Crick base pair between adenine and thymine. But if adenine is in its tautomeric form, in which you have this hydrogen, which was on this um, nitrogen atom, moves over to here, this is makes uh, the tautomer of um, of adenine, and that can base with cytosine, causing a mutation. So it's caused, or it could be caused by the movement of a proton from one atom to the other. So it could be a quantum mechanical uh, phenomenon. So these are um, bases and their tautomers. Um, adenine, if it goes into its imo, imine form, then it can form um, a, a base pair with cytosine instead of um, its normal base pair of thymine. And other tautomeric forms are shown here. Thymine goes into its enol form, and it can then pair with guanine. So these are potential causes of, of mutations, tautomeric forms, and that's what Watson and Crick proposed as a mechanism of mutation. But they didn't 
give any indication of how the totem was formed. It was known that a small amount of any base could be present in its totemary form, less than 1%. But how it gets there into the totemary form was known. And then um, this guy, uh, Per Olaf Lodin, proposed um, that, uh, first of all, he pointed out that uh, DNA code is a quantum code, and he was the first person to really say that. He proposed a mechanism by which um, bases could go into the tautomeric form by a double proton transfer. And here uh, you can see a base pair in its normal form. And um, actually, it's best if we go to the next slide, which will show it more clearly. So here's a double proton transfer. So two protons shift places. The two protons move over, and that generates both of the bases in their tautomeric form. Now, that could happen by two different ways. It could happen classically or it could happen by a, a proton tunneling mechanism. And of course, it, why the double, double proton transfer is because it preserves the charge across the double strands. If you had a proton going from one strand to the other, it would bring a positive charge to the complementary strand, and then it would cause electrochemical uh, reactions. So uh, you need a double proton transfer in order to get the um, conservation of charge across the double helix. So Per Olaf Lodin proposed that this double proton transfer was involved in mutation, and essentially, um, then in a in a DNA base, you get the double proton transfer, and that, that occurs by a tunneling reaction. Um, it's a very uh, it, there's quite a high barrier between the normal and the tautomeric form. It would not normally be expected to get there very readily because the, the uh, proton wouldn't have enough thermal energy to do that, but it could potentially tunnel to the tautomeric form. So potentially at the moment. So you can get a hydrogen tunneling event, which will allow then A to pair with C, G to pair with T, G to pair with um, uh, T and A to pair with C. So hydrogen tunneling, proton tunneling, could end up with the wrong base being incorporated in DNA because either the template base or the incoming base in DNA from DNA polymerase is in its tautomeric form. So that was proposed many years ago, many decades ago. Um, I won't go into that. Um, um, but the problem is that uh, mutation is a tricky thing. It's caused by many different um, uh, phenomena and um, whether a base, uh, the incorrect base, can be incorporated in the D into the DNA is dependent on a lot of things, not only the fidelity of the DNA polymerase. So this shows the DNA polymerase uh, enzyme, which does the copying of DNA. It incorporates a um, base that should be the correct base into this um, uh, position, but occasionally we incorporate the wrong base. But it has a number of different mechanisms to remove the wrong base. We call these proofreading that checks the fidelity of the, of the base pair. And if it finds a mismatch that the wrong base has been incorporated, DNA polymerase will pull it out. So it does proofreading. And then there's another system called mismatch repair, which will also repair mismatch bases. So there's lots of systems in, uh, DNA, in um, cells for preventing mutations. <clears throat> and this shows a mismatch repair system, which I won't go into, but it's essentially enzymes that recognize mismatches in DNA, like a CT pair, and remove them, correct them. So there's lots of those systems. So mutation is complex. Essentially, it requires not only for the mismatch to be incorporated in DNA polymerase, it's got to be missed by mismatch repair, and by, uh, sorry, the proofreading mechanism first, and then it has to be missed by the mismatch repair system. So a lot has to go wrong to generate a mutation. So um, there have been lots of theoretical studies of um, proton tunneling. I think I've got um, uh, some references. Okay, yes. So lots of theoretical studies. I, actually, I don't have the references. I meant to copy them in here, but forgot to. But there's been many 
uh, theoretical studies performed on looking at the um, likelihood of protons tunneling into the wrong position by this uh, double proton transfer method or other methods that might get their base into the incorrect automatic form. So lots of studies have looked at, at um, and I'll be looking at um, some in one of our uh, students, uh, I'll be looking at some of their theoretical work. But um, but is some evidence, some experimental evidence from X-ray crystal crystallography that demonstrates that they can form and it will, um, a CA mismatch. Uh, cytosine's the genetic letter C should normally be paired with guanine, G. But in this study, they um, incubated the, uh, the DNA polymerase enzyme with a tautomeric CA pair and found that it did get incorporated into the active site of the enzyme, indicating that the tautomeric form could form during DNA polymerase within the active site of the enzyme. <clears throat> and then NMR studies have demonstrated the tautomeric form in DNA, as well as a kinetic isotope effect. If you remember from the earlier part of the talk, kinetic isotope effects are often, not always, a sign of quantum mechanical phenomena. So they found that the frequency of finding the tautomeric form of DNA bases um, detected by NMR was affected, was influenced by whether the experiment was done in ordinary water, H2O or D2O, deuterated water. So that's all consistent with a potential um, um, proton tunneling event being involved in a mutation. So now I'll just introduce the um, Levy Hume Quantum Biology Doctoral Training Center, which was established in 2018 has 20 uh, students, um, in fact, it's 20, um, 22 students at its peak, eight graduating in 2021. They were delayed by uh, COVID. Most of them have graduated this year. And uh, supervisors from biology, physics, engineering, computer science, and mathematics, supported by the Levium Trust uh, over a five-year period, now extended to six years, taking into account uh, COVID uh, lockdowns. And the aim of the Quantum Biology Doctor Training Center was to establish a cohort of students working on quantum mechanical projects who would be the ideal uh, cohort of students to then go into, um, into studying and researching quantum biology more fully um, in their postdoctoral career. And there were a number of different areas that we proposed to work on, proton tunneling in DNA, but also avian compass, randomness, uh, photosynthesis, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> by the way, in, in the avian compass, I forgot to mention what I meant to mention. The avian compass, you're going to have Daniel Katnick, um, one of the world's experts on, um, on the radical pair mechanism, talking to you later on in, in the meeting. So please ignore anything I've said if, um, uh, and uh, focus on, on what Daniel's uh, talk is going to be all about. It seems a lot more about it than I do. Um, okay, so this, these are the students that we have. Um, uh, our first year intake, and one of them was uh, Louis, who did uh, some theoretical work on quantum tunneling. So Louis used density function the theory to describe how nuclei in DNA interact with the delocalized cloud of electrons forming bonds. However, in density function theory, the protons and nuclei are fixed and point-like, but in reality, they're also delocalized. And that's, of course, the uh, quantum um, character of uh, uh, the electrons and protons. And to model this delocalization, um, Louis used the open quantum systems approach to look at how smeared out the protons and electrons were. Mm -hmm. And this is demonstrated in, in this um, dia in this diagram here, this uh, graph, which shows, um, if we go back to thinking back to the um, to the tunnel reaction and asking the question whether a proton can go into the other well, the higher energy well, and whether it will go through a classical 
or quantum mechanical mechanism. So here is shown whether a proton, in other words, whether a base can shift in its tautomeric, into its tautomeric form by a proton tunneling event or by a classical over the barrier event. And what this shows is that at low temperatures, the classical over the barrier event doesn't happen at all because it requires a good deal of, uh, of thermal energy. Um, but the quantum through the barrier event, the proton tunneling through the barrier by a quantum mechanical mechanisms, quantum tunneling, um, will occur both at low temperatures and uh, slightly more at higher temperatures. And even at room temperature, the quantum mechanism, quantum tunneling, is, uh, is uh, at least a hundredfold more likely than classical over the barrier. So what uh, Louis's calculation suggested was that if tautomerization takes place in DNA, then it's much likely to take place via a quantum mechanical tunneling mechanism of protons from the normal to the tautomeric state than a classical over the barrier um, event. And what he found also was um, uh, a kinetic isotope effect that um, uh, uh, the, uh, this shows the ratio between the frequency of tunneling in um, in ordinary water and in uh, deuterated water. And what he showed was a kinetic isotope effect at um, uh, normal um, physiological temperatures, around about uh, 100. So we should be able to detect a kinetic isotope effect if uh, Lou is right. And uh, and this is published uh, in, a, in a recent paper from um, Louis and uh, Jim and Marco. Uh, so the conclusion was: work tautomers are continuously made and destroyed, but at a much higher time scale uh, than biological processes. So um, as the base will go into its tautomeric form very quickly, it will be present in its tautomeric form form in physiological DNA due to proton tunneling. And there's some more papers that he's published as well on this uh, um, approach. Now, does it really happen? Um, this is uh, work from another of our first year students, Antonio, um, who uh, has done, he's an experimentalist. We, our vision for the quantum biology doctoral training center was that both an experimentalist and a theoretician would work on the same project. That has been very hard to attain, but on this, in this case, we have. Um, so first of all, we ask a simple question. As Louis point, as uh, from Louis's um, predictions, we should have a, a kinetic isotope effect in the formation of muta mutations. So the first thing we did, so very easiest, simplest thing to do, was to grow E. coli in ordinary water and in heavy water, uh, nearly 100% D2O, and ask the question, is the mutation rate any different? So this shows E. coli, uh, the mutants are, are the dark dots in this system, and um, we just count them when we do the experiment in water or in D2O. And what um, Antonio found was there was a kinetic isotope effect. Uh, you can see that the uh, rate of mutation appeared to be depressed by um, a deuterium going from 100% water to 50% D2O to 100% D2O. So it came down to about half the level of mutation. So that was clearly uh, interesting and consistent with uh, Louis's um, theoretical work. Uh, but the trouble with it is that E. coli is, the system is so complex. There are lots of things that may be affected by growing E. coli in deuterated water. We know that deuterated water for mechanisms that really aren't entirely clear is toxic. If you try to grow E. coli in it straight away, they, you, they don't grow. So you have to, um, you have to grow them in, in lower levels of D2O and gradually increase the D2O until they become tolerant to it. And only then can you do the experiment. So clearly D2O is doing a lot of things in living cells. So this effect could be caused by something other than tautomerization. 
So we thought we had to get away from whole cells to, um, to a, an in vitro system. So that's what um, Antonio did next, um, using the PCR reaction, which amplifies DNA. And we amplified a gene that we can detect whether it's in a um, in its wild type normal form or mutant form by forming whether it forms blue and white colonies when we transform it back into E. coli. So what we do here is we replicate the DNA in vitro in a test tube, and then we can put that back into E. coli and find out whether the DNA that we've replicated is a mutated DNA or is it a non-mutated DNA. And then we can, because they form blue or white colonies, and then we can count them and find out if that DNA that we've made, um, and we can make the DNA in ordinary water, we can do the PCR reaction in ordinary water, or we did the PCR, or Antonio did the PCR reaction in deuterated water, and see if there was a difference. And there was. But now, um, the uh, uh, there was a difference, um, but now the number of mutants were higher in the deuterated water. In this case, it's the white uh, colonies that are mutants. So that indicated that um, um, in deuter deuterium, when we do the PCR reaction amplifier a, a, a gene in deuterium, it seems to have a higher rate of mutation. Um, but still, that's still kind of um, a little bit messy. So um, Antonio went to a cleaner system and um, in which he replicated DNA using just DNA polymerase and in the test tube. But we kept it simple with looking just at replication of a single base of DNA rather than the entire rather than the entire gene. So in this case, we're looking for the generation of a base pair, a GT base pair, which is, is a mutational base pair. It's the wrong error. It's the wrong base pair. And it's generated by a, a, something called a wobble and then a tautomerization. So what Antonio did was <clears throat> make a template DNA, had that synthesized, a template DNA of a particular sequence. And then a primer, which is what you prime the DNA sequence, the DNA replication on, which is short, shorter than the template. And that, and that provides an addition, a, um, a substrate for addition of a nucleotide that will come in homologous to this nucleotide that's empty here. So we can do this experiment in the, uh, in the lab and look at a particular base pair and ask whether this step of putting this nucleotide onto the DNA at this point is sensitive to, does it have a kinetic isotope effect? So we can, uh, what Louis did was have a G at this position here, and the correct base that it should bear with, it, pair with is then C, cytosine. But what Antonio did was to conduct the experiment with C as the um, incoming nucleotides, or T as the in incoming nucleotides, and ask the question, is, does deuterium affect this reaction? Because in order for the T to be incorporated, either it or the template G has to be in the tautomeric form. So what he then looked at is whether this shift to the tautomeric form that he can detect by its incorporation of the wrong base, is that affected by deuterium? So looking at it again in a more abstract way, here's our template, it has a G here. And in the first experiment, we put in C and it puts in a normal base pair, okay? And then the next experiment, we only have T's there. Those will form a base pair only if it's tautomeric only if we one of the two of the bases shifts in the tautomeric form. And we can measure that. We can measure it because this is nine base pairs, and if it puts the T in, it's going to go to 10 base pairs, and we can measure the length of this strip of DNA that we're making. And we could do that in both water 
and heavy water, deuterated water. We do the experiment, and that's what Antonio did. And first of all, he, um, you, uh, so here is the, uh, with the DCTP as the incoming nucleotide that will form a base pair, a correct base pair with G. And the nucleotide concentration, and what this shows is how fast the reaction goes. So it's soon saturated a very low concentration of, of 0.1 millimolar DCTP. DTTP now, um, we, he repeated the experiment with DTTP, and now the T has got to come in here. So one or other of those bases has to be in the tautomeric form. To force the reaction, because it doesn't want to do this, the innate polymerase is not keen on making a mutation, he has to use much higher concentration of nucleotides. So you can see that we're now in the millimolar range to drive the same reaction, but he's driven the reaction with a high concentration of nucleotides in order to get the same level of the mismatched base pair as the matched base pair, and then look to see if uh, deuterium has an effect. So he looks at um, whether uh, he looks at whether the base has been extended or not. The primer has been extended by that one base by gel electrophoresis, and um, what he showed was he can distinguish um, uh, a nucleotide sequence that's either ten, nine, or ten base pairs, and that was our primer was nine base pairs. And if it was correctly, if it was extended either correctly or, in, or incorrectly, it would be 10 base pairs. So we measured that experiment. This shows, this shows the reaction over time. And you can see that um, um, this is the short, the template, well, um, um, what's it, uh, here? okay. Here's a short temp uh, template molecule of nine base pairs. And that gradually diminishes as it goes to 10 base pairs during the reaction. So the nine base pair, um, uh, the uh, amount of that in the products decreases and the 10 base pair uh, DNA strand with the extended uh, single base pair increases. So we did that in H2O and D2O and didn't find any difference. So this shows the reaction in which now this is the template and this is the amount of um, of the extended base uh, made in, in ordinary water of uh, 40.8% of the DNA has been extended and in D2O, 40.6%, statistically indistinguishable. So in this, the most rarefied way that we've been able to measure a kinetic isotope effect in replication of DNA, it doesn't show one. So um, no evidence for a heavy isotope effect. But again, DNA replication is complicated. So maybe something's happening at the proof of reading mechanism or the mismatch repair mechanism to repair a mutation that has been introduced. And maybe it's repairing the defective one more readily, I don't know. It's in this system, it shouldn't because it doesn't have the exonuclease and it doesn't have the mismatch repair. But still, I'm not quite sure if that's the final word yet. So, quantum genes, strong, strong theoretical evidence for proton tunneling in DNA. Does it cause mutations? Not sure yet. Uh, so far, we've got contradictory um, data from. Um, from uh, cells, PCR reaction, and this uh, primer extension method. So I'll say a little bit more about the Quantum Biology Doctor Training Center then where this study was performed. Um, so this was the structure of it, five years funding, 21 PhD scholarships, uh, three years of intake starting from October 18. In fact, because of COVID, we've got another uh, year of intake. Um, so those are subjects that we were working on. Um, uh, so the products were projects in a range of different um, um, topics, proton tunneling in DNA, mutation, photosynthesis, photosynthesis and nanotechnology, and photosynthesis with nanotechnology, biological noise and coherence, and um, avian navigation, and several more projects looking at, for example, we have another project looking at um, 
at a photoreception uh, of uh, rhodopsin in the eye and whether that's quantum mechanical. So we have a number of different projects. We have another project looking at drug activation and uh, which so shows some potential quantum mechanical effects. So a number of different projects. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, Clarice was saying we, um, it would be useful to have a discussion about how to promote quantum biology. Um, what we did in the quantum biology doctoral training center at Surrey was uh, the first problem we, we knew we would encounter is the lack of, of a common language between physics, particularly theoretical physics, the hard-nosed mathematical physics, and biology and biologists. Um, many biologists have gone into biology because they can't do the maths. So they have a problem with understanding um, uh, the mathematical side of physics and, of course, quantum mechanics is, is very much mathematical. So to try to promote understanding between the two sides, what we got our students to do, first of all, we thought, okay, we have to teach the biologists some quantum mechanics, maybe Jim, Jim Akalili could teach the, um, the biology students, and maybe uh, I'd teach some biology to the uh, physics students. But then we thought that wasn't the real, right way to do it. What we decided in the end, was the physics students would teach quantum mechanics to the biologists, and the biology students would teach physics uh, would teach biology to the physicists. And what that forced them to do was find a common language in which they could understand each other. And um, and I think that's been very important and allowed uh, them to communicate much more readily. They also share the same office and they talk to each other in the same office, and that's also been important. Their experimental work is, however, done in, in different labs across the campus, so that's a bit of a uh, an issue um, that we can't really um, solve at the moment. But the challenges that we've encountered is getting the theory and experiment to work together. It's... Um, it's difficult. It's uh, uh, the theoreticians are, uh, are keen to do their theory projects. Experimentalists want to do their experiment. But really, what the easiest way to get publications is, of course, doing the standard stuff to to do the things that they all know how to do best and get publications and getting them to do the hard stuff where you're really interrogating this quantum mechanical system with both a theoretical and experiment um, is is more difficult. Um, so it's hard, and uh, those are the kind of issues we're, that we've faced. But nevertheless, we've um, had um, uh, a lot of successes. Here's um, our current, uh, or quite a lot of our current group of students who attended the um, Quebs meeting, Quantum Effects in Biological Systems, which was in Crete last year. And uh, here's, uh, while we were in lockdown, we decided to write a um a review on quantum biology, which um, is, um, uh, was published in 2021. Um, and we've, uh, our students have generated um, uh, lots of papers. Um, uh, some of Louis, for example, uh, you've already met, but uh, many of our other students have also generated papers and are continuing to generate papers. So despite the challenges where uh, our students are, are quite productive. The other thing we do, which... Um, uh, which we're promoting. It's not. Uh, um, it's not essential in the in quantum in the quantum biology doctoral training center. Is a hybrid thesis, and a hybrid thesis allows the students to write the papers first. What the students can do is write up all their work as manuscripts, as if they were going to publish them, and hopefully publish them before they come to their PhD viva. But as long as they're written up as manuscripts ready to be published or submitted, then it's acceptable as part of a PhD thesis. And I think this is very important in a subject like this, where it's hard to get enough done um, when you're trying to pull together distant parts of, uh, of uh, physics and, and biology. It's a challenge. And if you're not careful, you're going to have students who will overcome the challenges but not be able to write up the papers. This allows the students to focus on writing up the papers and they can then bind them straight into their uh, PhD thesis. 
uh, without having to rewrite them. And I think it makes it much easier for them. And I know that uh, Louis, for example, and um, uh, went down that route in his PhD um, thesis. And the other thing I ought to mention is we are hosting the next uh, quantum effects in biological systems um, at, uh, at the University of Surrey in June next year. Um, and that's uh, about it. Uh, any questions? Oh, um, yeah. Any questions? Jonjo, we cannot hear. Oh, really? Okay. Um, Sorry. Okay. Yep. Uh, I think John Joe is looking. Okay, so for, for those of you who life. do not know, John Joe and his colleague Jimo Kalili have written, uh, for me, the best uh, layman book on uh, quantum biology. And it's a very fun read. It's called Life on the Edge in English. And I think apparently, from what I saw in the slide, there is a, a Portuguese version. Yeah, yes. I, I should have uh, shared that before giving up, uh, <laughs> giving up the. Uh, let me see if I can uh, put it up there very quickly. Share screen. Uh, da, 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 da. Here we go. Um, so there it is. Um, Life on the Edge, Portuguese, published by Bluka, and uh, available in all good book bookstores in Brazil. Okay, thank you for cool. giving you, me the opportunity to uh, <laughs> sell a few copies. I hope. Sure. And thank you for being so generous with your time. You've been here with right. for a while. Uh, so, John Joe, uh, here uh, you are talking to me. I'm Clarice, for those of you who do not know. I am Marcelo Souza. And uh, I think we could start uh, with the compliments. Uh, uh, we have a, a list of people to. Yes. Uh, thanks. Do, do want, so Mar Marcelo and I would really like to thank the, the IDOR team who are so strongly supporting this emerging field of quantum biology. So we have a list of a partial list of people. Thank you so much, Jorge, Jorge Sergio, Sergio, Claudio, Duda, Michele, Diego, Alini, Rosiani. Who else are we forgetting? For thank everybody who worked to make it happen. And uh, I would say that uh, for us, it was uh, tough, but very grateful to, to, to making to it happen. Uh, just uh, before to, to go for the, the questions, I would like to say that three years ago, I found the John Joe's books in a, in a fair. And I read the book as I was reading a novel. It's really amazing. And I couldn't realize that three years later, I would be here uh, helping to organize it. So life is weird, not only in quantum <laughs> biology sense, but in, in whole senses. And uh, it's very pleasurable. I would like to open for questions. And I, 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 I saw Marcelo Paleologo has one question. Please just raise your hands. Uh, but before to start, I would like to, to ask a question by myself, because when I was uh, talking to, to my colleagues, physicists, bio, biologists, chemists, and uh, when I talk about quantum biology, one of the most frequent questions is, but why is it different from just... Uh, Molecular biology, for example, why why the need to to have a new name, and uh, probably John Joy have to answer this question or some type of questions related to that. But as all uh, attendees uh, in vast majority are uh, seeing quantum biology by the first time, I think it would be great to to have John Joe's views about that. Uh, before to to start the to open for more questions, uh, so John, uh, thank you, no. thank you. Um, I, I must apologise that in fifteen minutes I am going to have to leave. Unfortunately, I have to go to another meeting. I hope that's okay. Um, but uh, the question you asked: Why uh, do we need 
to why isn't it just molecular biology? Well, I was I started as a biochemist and then became a molecular biologist. But we are still stuck in, in biochemistry, molecular biology, with thinking about biology in the ball and stick mode, in which we think of atoms as ball and stick um, uh, entities pre present only at a single point in space and molecules to be exactly as we draw them with balls and sticks. But quantum mechanics tells us that they're not really balls and sticks and that um, um, particles like electrons and proteins don't really have a defined um, location in, in space. And um, that, I think, isn't... That's really why biologists have a problem with it, I think, because... They've been brought up without quantum mechanics, without the knowledge of how things are really at a fundamental particle level in um, in any system, not only biological systems, but because it matters at that, you know, the position of a single particle makes a difference in biology, whereas it doesn't make a difference in a chair or a table. And that's why biology is different. The, the position of this proton, say, in DNA can make a difference to whether you live or die. If, if you have a, a lethal mutation, if it causes a lethal mutation. So that kind of sensitivity to position at the quantum mechanical level is peculiar to biology. And position at a quantum mechanical level isn't how classically trained scientists think about position. They think about position as being single positions, whereas in quantum mechanics, position is fuzzy and it makes a difference. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, I think next question, Marcelo Paleolo. Hello. Oh, yeah, cool. It's working. So um, first of all, thanks for the very interesting uh, talk. Um, that well, I learned a lot. So it's, it's thank you. Very nice. Yeah, thank you. So uh, one question that I have is uh, so regarding this this tautometry and the 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 effect of of mutations and so on uh, i have a kind of experimental question which is the following so the the, the tautometry is a so two possible configurations of your molecule right so i'm going to assume that there is a particular frequency that you can uh, that you so you can bring an external uh, oscillating field at this frequency And, and, and this resonance frequency will actually induce the change of configuration in the molecule. Wouldn't that be simpler than, than using the, the, the deuterium in the sense that you, you would create a, a medium that is inside this, this, this oscillating field? And then you would have kind of um, a statistical mixture of the two possible configurations that that would uh, change the 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 rate of of mutations or something like that. I completely agree um, that that would be a good experiment to do, uh, and we've been planning to do it, and we were planning to do it uh, at the Felix terahertz um, source in Niemingen in the Netherlands. Uh, unfortunately, it was closed during COVID, and we've not been able to get access to it since. Um, uh, so we haven't been able to do those experiments, but I agree, particularly as as with Louis' theoretical work, we can make some predictions about the frequencies, as you say, the frequencies of the shift from um, the, the proton, and we should be able to excite the system at that frequency and see if it makes a difference. And certainly that would be an interesting experiment to do. Uh -huh. Sergio Ferreira, our colleague from IDOR, will make a very interesting question, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I, I, thanks, John Joel. It was really a um, wonderful um, stage setting for this meeting. So thank you very much for your time and, and um, willingness to participate. Um, uh, my, the question that I have is actually a very um, a broader one. It's not a specific uh, scientific question. It's more of a, a community building uh, directed uh, question. So as you know, as Clarice has mentioned, uh, one of the key motivations for this meeting is to build a community of 
um, people working and interested in, in the quantum biology field. And uh, you've shown us this very successful, still young, but quite successful already initiative of the graduate program, uh, sorry. Um, and I, I wonder actually how this came to be, because we saw a sort of a current snapshot of what the program looks like. My question is, how did you get the, because recruiting students seems to be the easiest part to me. The hardest part would be to have the supervisors around who are interested and, and work in this, in this field. So did you recruit people to work on this field? Did they already happen to be on the same campus? How does the story go, actually? Yeah, it's a complicated story. Um, <clears throat> Jim and I, uh, Jim Alkhalili and I, became interested in quantum mechanics about 20, quantum biology about 20 years ago, when I was puzzling over an odd form of mutation uh, that occurred in bacteria called adaptive mutations and was thinking whether it might have a quantum mechanical cause. I've recently read um, <clears throat> John Gribbin's book, Schrodinger's Cat, which is an excellent introduction to quantum mechanics. And I thought that it might uh, um, it might be useful to think about quantum mechanics in, in DNA mutation. I gave a talk in the physics department at Surrey, University of Surrey, and Jim was in the audience. And although it was very skeptically received, my ideas um, were very skeptically received. They were polite. And Jim was good enough to come up afterwards to me and uh, and offer to work together. And we wrote a paper on this in 1921. Sorry, not 1921. Uh, in about 2000, 2001 or two, I think it was about 20 years ago. So we, um, but nothing much else happened until Greg Engel's work um, and Greg Scholes's work demonstrated. Um, uh, quantum beats in photosynthesis and then interest in quantum biology started to grow we applied to the Levium trust and this was really crucial that we could get some money for it we i tried we tried several times to get funding in the uk for quantum biology and it was always considered too speculative too wacky the uh, funding bodies would um, say that they're um, open to new ideas, to speculative research. But when it went to the reviewers, they really poo-pooed it and said, no, this is too speculative. But the Levium Trust is an interesting organisation that funds work that cannot be funded by the standard funders. So it uh, um, very thankfully came along and gave us a million pounds to set up the quantum biology doctoral training center at the university of surrey we got resources from the university of surrey but you're right the other the other aspect was getting the people together and no no one apart from me and jim had heard of quantum biology at the university really so we had to persuade our colleagues that there was this interesting area of science that they could move into and we have done to a certain extent but <laughs> As with all PhD supervisors, supervisors tend to get the studentship, but then they want to go off and work on what they know and love rather than this new and wacky area that may not get them publications because it may turn out to be wrong in uh, the investigation that they um, have proposed. So it's difficult sometimes to get the quantum back into the projects. We, they have a title when the projects are proposed by an academic who wishes to get a student, they always have quantum in the title, but it it's, can sometimes be a challenge to, for it to remain there. So that's a challenge. Um, but we also recruited a, um, a new lecturer in quantum biology, uh, Dr. Young Chan Kim, who um, was previously at NIH and had demonstrated quantum coherence in um, fluorescent proteins, green fluorescent proteins. So we recruited him. So he's a first, first academic. Uh, I think Clarice, you may be the only other academic in the world who is dedicated to quantum biology. Um, and um, um, uh, so we were great. It was great that he he came came to Surrey and helped to um, um, pilot uh, uh, his work at um, at uh, uh, the quantum biology doctor training center at Surrey. But it is a challenge. I mean, we've um, we do uh, actually. There should have been a few more slides in there, which. Uh, pointed out things like the seminar that we do in collaboration with uh, Clarice's group at UCLA to try to keep things going, to try to keep people interested and recruit more people to the area, I think, is the key thing. 
But it's hard because ultimately to work in the quantum biology area, you need funding. And um, it's hard to get funds for stuff that is still considered to be speculative. Uh, it's a challenge, but it's a challenge where we'll keep trying on. Hi, Professor. Uh, so first of all, thank you for your amazing lecture. I have a very simple question. Uh, when you mentioned this uh, PCR experiment using deodorated water and it actually showed differences between the reaction that was performing in deuterium versus the regular water, uh, why did you decide that you required further evidence and then uh, use the primer extension? Uh, was the previous ex uh, experiment was not consistent or, or was the reason yeah. that you you need more evidence in a different system. Yeah, once you, as you probably know, if you do if you do biological experiments, experiments, there's a lot of noise in them. So there was quite a lot of error in uh, the colony counting. When essentially what we did was use a PCR reaction to make a gene, transformed it into E. coli, and then did colony counting. I agree with you that uh, actually it could have been enough, and we may. Um, what why we went into the primary extension was because of the noise of the colony counting, we thought we could get a really clean result from the primary extension method um, that would be easier to, to convince uh, reviewers. But in fact, it gave us a result we didn't want, that there was no difference. So we're perplexed at the moment, and um, um, but we will go back and, and maybe, as you say, maybe fix on the quantum, on the PCR method, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm puzzled, um, but that was the reason why we went to primer extension to try to re reduce the errors error rate. We still had a significant result, but it was significant at the ninety five percent level rather than ninety nine percent level. Now we could do lots more PCRs and make it significant at the at the ninety nine percent level. I hope, but we went to the primer extension method instead. Um, hello, John Joe. It's uh... Paul Davies here. Sorry you're not oh, with us. Hi, Paul. Having a great time. Um, uh, I loved your talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask a sort of very general question. So uh, DNA is at the beginning of a whole chain of causation, and there are a lot of downstream places where glitches could occur in the RNA, in the ribosomes, in the uh, transferase molecules, and so on. Uh, is anybody looking at, uh, at, at quantum perturbations in that down, downstream uh, causal chain? Um, well, we have a project um, looking at helicase, which is one of the enzymes. Well, it is the enzyme that unwraps the DNA. And we are looking at whether that, that may have some quantum mechanical um, phenomena. One of our PhD students is, is investigating that. Um, but that's the only thing I can think of that uh, people are, that uh, other groups are working on in that area. Um, but I agree with you, there's lots more to study. And, um, and I think that lots more needs to be studying. For example, um, things like methylation that um, I know you're interested in epigenetics, and whether that has a quantum mechanical aspect to it as well, where you had, say, a methyl group to DNA could easily have quantum mechanical aspects. So um, we need just need more, more people working in the area to um, fill it out with um, uh, looking for quantum, quantum mechanical phenomena. The problem is that unless you have a, this is the difficulty I think with funding bodies, unless you have a phenomenon that you can't account for by classical means, it's hard to get funding for saying, well, we think quantum mechanics might be involved. And that's why those areas where there is a gap in the knowledge, like in photosynthesis, Greg Engel's quantum beats, that got funding in the avian navigation system um, where it was hard to account for a, um, a compass in, in, a, in a, wet, a warm, wet animal. How does, it, how does it make this compass? And it was a, um, an inclination compass and those kind of, and it depended on light. These were puzzles. And I think we need more puzzles. And I think as we go more and more looking at a molecular level, uh, at individual molecules, we will find more puzzles. I think a lot of the puzzles are being diluted out by our inability to 
look at individual molecules in living cells. We have to look at the whole cell and whole um, consortia of molecules rather than individual molecules. And I think that to me is the is the challenge as we go further. And, and the techniques are, are, are getting there to look at um, individual molecules you can do with some enzymes. So I hope we will be there soon. So if I may uh, uh, make another question, this is more, a more specific one. I, I was wondering in your base extension um, uh, experiments or in your PCR experiments, uh, you, you were actually looking at the spontaneous rates of mutations that would happen there, depending on whether it's in pure water or deuterated water. I was wondering, uh, we all know that there are these mutagenic agents like ultraviolet light, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, you couple that experiment with uh, UV light and maybe you get an exciton that will promote mutagenesis. Is that something that you've been thinking about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, forming uh, thymidine dimers, which is what UV, UV light uh, does. If that's not quantum mechanical, I'll eat my hat. I mean, it's got to be, it hasn't it? It's got to be some quantum mechanical aspects to that where a photon of UV uh, radiation is absorbed, then you um, and you fuse two um, timely uh, um, units together. That has got to involve quantum mechanical aspects, and I think in many other aspects, many other mutagenic agents, they will have phenomena that are only explicable at the quantum mechanical level. But as far as I know, people aren't specifically looking for um, for them, and um, I guess the question often arises. Why should we care? And this is, I think, the um, most biologists' aspect. Okay, this may be going by a quantum mechanical me mechanism. Why should we care? Because biologists are usually motivated by outcomes, things that you can do something about, like make a new drug, make a new, me make a new treatment, a new diagnosis. And whether this goes by a quantum mechanical mechanism, say mutation, or by a classical mechanism, is uh, is not something that um, they care too much about, particularly as they don't know what a quantum mechanical mechanism is. So it's hard to get as, I think the field needs more biologists to get involved. The biologists who work on those systems like uh, um, the downstream um, stuff that Paul was talking about and, um, and really try to unpick whether quantum mechanical phenomena are involved. But we, they need motivation. They need to know why we need to know about quantum mechanics. John Joe, it's Clarice here. I'm going to ask you this question because we won't have the opportunity to discuss this particular theme very much during this meeting. Can you comment on uh, the ways that possibly ion channels, uh, the, the functioning of ion channels might be mediated uh, by quantum effects? Yeah, that, that's a, an area where um, we have a stu couple of students working on, on this. In uh, That wasn't on one of the slides because it was one of, the, one of our later projects. But um, uh, work, um, theoretical work has um, made a, um, a case for ion channels for ions going through ion channels in membranes of cells. All, all cells have channels that allow ions like sodium ions, potassium ions, calcium ions to pass through. They pass through one at a time. So it's already singular. There's a singular ion that passes through and that already makes you think maybe quantum mechanics may be involved. And uh, theoretical work has, has made a case for ions passing through ion channels as um, quantum coherently, and they could explain why the ion channels do it are so fast and why they are so specific. Um, but it's theoretical. We're doing some work, um, uh, Federico in my lab and, um, and uh, Cedric are doing some work on uh, looking at ion channels and looking for quantum mechanical influences. And we've shown that there's a kinetic isotopic effect in ion channels, but kinetic isotope, uh, uh, isotope effects are a bit messy because putting a neuron in deuterated water, it's gonna know that it's deuterated, it changes the viscosity and other things. So we have to um, uh, do a lot of controls. But also um, modeling that we've done so far suggests that electromagnetic fields may be able to have an influence. And we've been looking at both electromagnetic field effects 
and kinetic, kinetic isotope effects. And they seem to be multiplicative in that they don't act independently. And that's also kind of in, indicative of a quantum mechanical mechanism. And, um, and if so, then that could be fascinating because of course, neuronal ion channels are how our brain works. Um, all um, action potentials in the brain are delivered through ions running through ion channels. So it could be a way of getting quantum mechanics back in the brain. I don't think the Penrose Hammerhoff microtubule uh, proposal is uh, is tenable, but certainly ion channels could be in, um, involve quantum mechanical mechanisms. <clears throat> yes, well, I think in the same way here in Marcelo Souza, uh, I think in the same way uh, uh, the question of Clarice. Um, I would like to ask a little bit of the photon absorption by biological molecules, for example, in the retina and uh, in other parts of the old body in the organism. We 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 already know that uh, there are uh, several substances, molecules in your body that can be can have its functions mediated by light and uh, it could be a way uh, to to use uh, quantum quantum biology to interact with medical applications and um, i would like to ask if uh, in <clears throat> your uh, do you think it's a possible way to for that type of interaction a uh, historical fact that is very interesting is that uh, I think in 1932, uh, Niels Bohr talked about the interaction of photons uh, and life in a, in a lecture. And a uh, uh, few years from now, uh, we'd, uh, we discovered several uh, molecules in skin and in muscles uh, and even in neurons that can be mediated by the this type of absorption. So it could be a way to somehow interact and use quantum mechanics to uh, really tinkering uh, with uh, biological molecules, with cells. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to, to ask you ab about it <laughs> and more specifically, about uh, uh, the photon absorption in retina, for example, that is the one that is most known for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a, it is a very interesting system and almost certainly involves quantum mechanics. Essentially what happens is when a rhodopsin molecule uh, absorbs a photon of light, it changes its structure. Now that change of structure is if you were trying to work it out, you'd have to use quantum mechanics. So the cell must be, or the, protein must be encountering quantum mechanics when it changes its structure. I agree that those ways into that, that could be the way of trying to get application to an understanding of biology at the quantum mechanical level by looking how you can use, for example, light, as you say, to interrogate systems, to interact with systems, to develop new imaging systems, to develop new diagnostic systems. And um, we have some projects I think I mentioned already, we have a project looking at rhodopsin to see if that involves the uh, change in the rhodopsin molecule involves a quantum tunneling event. And we also have, um, uh, have uh, the uh, studies on looking at um, putting pigments onto, um, onto nanoparticles to see if we can use them to introduce light into cells and produce some quantum, some effect that could be mediated by quantum mechanics. We also have another project. Uh, it's too early to really uh, describe these projects in any, any detail, but we have another project that looks at the activation of a drug, a drug that is a pro-drug. It's a drug that is used in clinical medicine and it gets activated inside cells to become the active form of the drug. The activation is an oxidation and it almost certainly forms free radicals. And uh, we and some uh, colleagues that were looking at um, this system have shown that it's sensitive to both isotopic substitution and magnetic fields. And that could be an interesting way of interfering. If a drug 
can be um, manipulated quantum mechanically, and you could imagine, for example, activating your drug in a particular tissue, such as a cancer tissue, and that would be hugely um, uh, useful. So I think thinking about going beyond the, if you like, the um, the investigating quantum systems in living cells to thinking about how we can get quantum mechanical apparatus onto living cells that will respond in quantum mechanical ways and provide new ways of, of interacting with uh, living systems, particularly in medicine, could be a, a great way forward. And <laughs> unfortunately, that note, I do have to go to another meeting now, I'm afraid. But, uh, um, uh, but I hope that, um, that answers your question. Thank you. Really answers. And uh, I have to say that uh, it was not a naive question. Tomorrow, I will talk a little bit about uh, photobibulation and photoceuticals that are the uh, somehow connected with that question. And for me, it was great to, to hear your explanations and uh, very inspiring. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you for everyone who's listening. And uh, sorry, I have to leave. Sorry, I couldn't be there. But um, uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your meeting. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you, John Jones.